morning, Hank. Hello, Stan. Good morning. I saw. Move my head down. I saw. <laughs> Hi, Sammy. Did you get Patricia's email, Saul? Um, no, I didn't find it. I asked Stan. He doesn't have it. So hopefully she'll be at the meeting today and we'll just ask her. Yeah, because <laughs> I've been through uh, both the... Uh, I just got dumped and now I'm back. We noticed. <laughs> that seems to happen within the first two or three minutes of starting a meeting and it eventually stops. It happened when I was uh, attending a Zoom meeting set up by a court in Hawaii. Hmm. Just uh, yesterday. Obviously not the best timing. <laughs> no, but it was okay. It, it happened within the first minute or two minutes. Um, what would you say this last one was? within two minutes of when I started the meeting? Uh, yeah, I guess, because we haven't been here very long. Yeah. And then it didn't happen again. It used to happen two or three times, and then it would quit. Mm -hmm. Quit happening. <laughs> If Sam, Sammy's trying to talk to us, she needs to unmute her microphone. Does everybody understand what we're covering this morning? Um, I forget what we're covering. This it was snipping and snapping or uh, the window uh, snipping cutting, tool. Oh, snipping the window, tool. Yeah, the snipping tool, right. I what, is, what is it? I'm, I'm not understanding. It, it, it's the it's a built-in function of the Windows operating system that allows you to do screen captures. A week of Windows, okay. Is there an equivalent, Saul, in in, um, in Apple? Yeah, the yeah the Mac operating system has built-in uh, keyboard shortcuts to do a variety of different screen captures, where you can either capture the entire screen, or you can set it where you can drag a, an area of the screen that you want to capture and you can send it either to the clipboard or you could send it as an image to the desktop more g whiz it, it's all a combination of which buttons you push it's true of a lot of things in the computer world in the world, period.
Hi, Arlene. Good morning. I'm going to leave you for a few minutes while I go find my headphones. I'll be back. Okay. That is a good looking screen. It looks a lot. Yes. One that it I'm is a, a Chinese screen, and uh, she has mentioned that they're uh, thinking of moving away from their um, condo in La Jolla. And as a matter of fact, uh, she's offering uh, some of her uh, Chinese influence to furniture and accessories to a good home. If anybody is interested in some very interesting uh, furniture pieces. I already have enough. <laughs> Me too. While I was stationed on Guam, I kind of filled up the, uh, the house. Then in the divorce, some of them disappeared. Yeah, that happens. So I went back to Guam and bought some more. <laughs> no, Patricia. Well, it's only it's early. It's only ten twenty-five. Ten twenty-five. And if Fran shows up, she probably has that information. How is it to be back in Hawaii, Hank? Um, I'm not back in Hawaii. I'm back in San Diego, having oh. been in Hawaii for a total of three days. Oh. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and part of Saturday. I thought you were going back there for the winter. I was. I decided to come back to San Diego I ha had a medical problem that I thought would be more rapidly treated here in San Diego at the Navy Hospital. I think you're correct. Yeah. Yeah, Hawaii is has a serious doctor shortage. And it takes a while to be seen. Of course, then I came back here and got a, got all ready to be seen and <laughs> discovered that my my urologist had just gone on two weeks vacation. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. That's not exactly what I said. Mm -mm. It's close. Started with O. <laughs> yeah. Oh Hi everybody. Took me a while to get on. Hi Marty. <laughs> Hi Stan. Well, you're still here before the meeting is to start, so you're good. Yeah. Yeah, we get a lot more attendees between 1029 and uh, 1034 or five or six. <laughs> I know, I never know when to quit that's your phone we're listening to marty i know my husband will get it thank goodness for voicemail we can ignore people
I've got to go look at my Chinese screen and see if it's got those figures on it. I feel like we're the Brady Bunch. We have nine tiles. Yeah. Got nine tiles. Dan, did you get the minutes that I just sent out the other day? Yes, yeah, so I was just going to thank you for them. I did receive them. Thanks to Saul, my editor. <laughs> yeah. It's Saul's always it's has, always proofreading has, somebody else's work. It's always easier to do that. Well, you know, you know, I thought about it. What I should do is just send you one copy because it, you're right. When you do it yourself, you don't see a lot of that stuff. But I should send it to you first and then send out to everybody. <laughs> that would be fine. Um, I don't catch my own mistakes for the same reason. Yeah, this is the same thing at work. I have to have somebody else read it. Or, or I have read theirs. We just trade. I see Paul is in twice, probably on his phone and his computer. Muted. I think he's trying to talk. I thought he was trying to find the microphone unmute button. Yeah. Uh, We're missing Will. I think he said, well, I'm not sure. Every now and, he, now and then he says, I'm not going to be able to be there this Saturday. And then he shows up. Well, along that line, I don't necessarily plan to be here next Saturday um, <laughs> because I have another activity. And depending on how tired and dirty and whatever I am, it should finish before this meeting finishes. So I might join you late. What activity is it? Um, we're doing a neighborhood cleanup. Oh, nice. That's lovely. Good so, civic responsibility. So it's supposed to run from about nine to eleven. So if if I get back here somewhere after eleven, I may you'll still probably be in session. We do ours on the twenty second. Oh, so coming up. Six miles. And that's the same day next Saturday. Already? <laughs> Time keeps marching on. No, it's going at a rapid gallop. Yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> I keep getting notices from uh, the kids of uh, my old friends. And you know what that notice says. Yeah. Hank, I know you were a longtime friend of my dad, and I'm <laughs> sorry to tell you. Da, 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 da. Got one this week. On the other end of the spectrum, I had a good time this morning because I got to watch my granddaughter's field hockey game in uh, Oneonta, New York in the fall foliage at her campus is just gorgeous. It was a perfect weekend. I had trouble concentrating on the play instead of the, <laughs> the beautiful background. It is really nice back there. She's just a little bit west of uh, Albany, New York. Yeah, mid-October, that's the peak Yep. in New England. Yep. I, I just left the beautiful leaves in Milwaukee it was a shame because this, you'd go around a corner and suddenly there the, all these trees would be like on fire. The maples were, you know, orange and red. It was ju it's just gorgeous. But I'm back in San Diego. There you go. And uh, nothing like the fall in the back there. That's right. It's it's great fun to be in New England for that one weekend in October. <laughs> but the rest of the weekends between there and March suck <laughs> so uh i haven't been back to new england since my father died mm. 
Arlene, I must admit, I uh, introduced, there was a question about your background, and I said something about that you were might be looking for a home for some of your Oriental Asian um, uh, furniture pieces. So uh, if you're still looking for a home for some of those pieces, you might mention it if you're interested. Yeah, we have uh, probably, we brought too much furniture with us when we moved. So some of it could be relieved. <laughs> yeah, I moved 14 times, but uh, 13 of those were paid by the Navy. <laughs> that makes it easier. <laughs> much. I have a screen that's very much like that, Arlene. I just left while you were gone. I've got was gone too to take a picture of my screen, and uh, maybe I can get it put together while the video is playing and show it on here later. Where'd you? Where did you get yours? Uh, in New York. <laughs> An Oriel screen from. A not very oriental place. All, all they sold was oriental furniture. And why why was that of interest to you? Um, well, we enjoyed what little time we spent in the Orient, in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Japan. And Oh, that's great. When were you in Hong Kong? 1968. My gosh. I'm trying to remember when I was. Yeah, I was in Hong Kong. Um, about that time. Uh, <laughs> Hank, Hank. Yeah. May I share my screen? Joan, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, some of it is uh, that you won't be interested in, but there's some pictures I want you to see and I'll skip through the others. Okay. Sounds like fall foliage to me. Some of it, yes. Okay, here we go. So I got to make sure I'm doing it right here. Okay. Actually, ignore the top ones there. This right here is uh, right now today I'm making chow and I had that much. Anyway. Down below, that's our legislature building in town at night. This is in an art gallery. I'm going to get to the foliage. This is foliage and a flowering crab, but that is basically the foliage is gone. This is a couple of things from the garden that uh, a deer or a raccoon decided to eat at night. And this, these are the tomatoes that I'm making chow out uh, for my neighbor. Now, this down here is uh, at our park. It's uh, called a beaver pond. This is a maple tree right beside my house. Oh, pretty. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So anyway, these two are just Thanksgiving. This is a couple of people that showed up in my dooryard that I found out were relatives. <laughs> this is my neighbor and me making cider, apple cider. Thanksgiving. Okay, now we're coming into this. Now these two pictures here, normally at my cottage at, at the lake, there's only three loons. This year there were 40. And uh, we decided they are stopping on their migration south. But the other thing that was different was the fact that they didn't make any noise at all. Okay. Mm. This is one of my watermelon that I grew. Wow. Okay, I'm getting to some more pictures here in a minute. Okay, here's some down here mm. as they started to turn. Wow. With a sunset. And an upside down grandchild. Mm -hmm. That was that was me. <laughs> Is that the one you're talking about, Hank? Anyway, this was fog a uh, fog one morning. This is burning. 
That's another one when it was changing. So it's not as pretty this year as it normally has been. Has been. So I think that's all I'm going to show you because that's all I have right now. Oh, except for this one right here, which is one of my mutant uh, carrots. Oh, wow. Okay. I think that's all. Taking down swallow houses. And the, the tree just starting on September the 25th. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. But the reds aren't as pretty this year for I don't we don't know why. We're up what? 17 participants and I don't think we're going to get many more because it is 10 almost 1040. And I don't see Patricia. Patricia, are you here? Not yet. Sometimes she but, comes in later. Yeah. Yeah. But I see Richard Hardy, and we haven't seen him in a long time. Welcome back. Yes. Absolutely. I think we should start. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Too. The rest of us got here on time. I will indeed. I need to get over to my spot. Yeah, there it is. Capturing a snip. And now I need to share my screen. Could you uh, mute us all first? Yep. Come on, screen, where are you? There you are. There. Capturing a snip. Turning on the sound. And here we go. See if I've got most of the black spots off here. I think so. There's one at the top and one near the bottom. Yeah, the one at the top I can't get rid of. Wait a minute. Yeah, the one I can't. This is a remake. Whoops, stop. Hush, Henry. All right, the one at the bottom is the... Ah. Unfortunately, I need to stop sharing for a minute and now get back to more and hide subtitles there. Now we'll try. There, the one at the bottom is gone. The one at the top is the one about sharing. Yeah, and if you go to the right edge of that, where there's a more or something, the far right button, it, there'll be a drop down and let you hide that. Really? I don't see that. Maybe. Try dragging it over to the left. Yeah, that's my whole. Nope. That's the best I can do. Okay, here we go. This is a remake of a mini seminar that I made in December 2015 using Windows 7. And this is about how to capture a snip or a screenshot of your screen or a portion of your screen. In Windows. First, you have to find the program. Then you have to pin it to your taskbar. Uh, 
You don't have to do that, but that's what I recommend. You then need to define the area you want snipped and save the snip. And I will demonstrate that now. First, you find the program. And to do that, you go to your start menu and scroll down. Yours is probably where mine is in Windows Accessories. GUW, Windows Accessories, and it's down alphabetically under Snipping Tool. Uh, if you want to put that, uh, put an icon for that snipping tool in your taskbar, which I recommend, you right click on that and then you right click on more or uh, hover over more and you will get an option to pin it to your taskbar. Mine is already pinned so it says unpin from the taskbar. Well, since it is in the taskbar, let's go down and click on it. When you do, you will find the snipping tool window to control your snip. You click on new, but before I do that, I want to show you that there are several modes of picking where you snip. You can do a free form snip, you can do a rectangular snip, which is what I prefer and will show you. You can do a snip of the whole window or a snip of the whole screen. Well, if you're set on a rectangular snip and you click new, you will get a rather hazy picture. And hold on. Now you will get a rather hazy picture. And you can then select a portion of what is on your screen. I'm going to choose to just select this much of the screen. You can choose whatever you want. And when you let go, you will see that you have a new window called Snipping Tool, which holds just that portion of your screen. And when you click on the Save the Snip icon here, you can then choose a name and location for that snip. I have always chosen it to be in Pictures, which is where you will uh, initially set up and in snips under pictures. There is a window in my pictures, and I think there will be a window in yours as soon as you start this, where you can click on snips, a folder called snips, and within that folder you can set up yourself any kind of, of hierarchy of saving folders that you wish. I have chosen it to do it by year, and therefore I am now, since it is September of 2022, I will now save this particular SNP, which I'm going to call SNP Demo, S-N-I-P Demo. That will be my the name of this file in the Pictures Snips 2022 folder. Oh, and I can also choose what form to save it. You can save it as a, a portable network graphic, a PNG file, a GIF file, a 
what is that called? A simple file HTML or the one I choose, a JPEG file. And once you have saved that, there you are. That's your file. You can email it to somebody. You can put it in a Word document. You can do anything else that you can do with a JPEG file. That is a story of how you snip. I hope it is useful to you. And we're back. Are there any questions? You're all muted, so you need to unmute. That was, so. that was fantastic, Hank. What say? That was fantastic. <laughs> it really was. I mean, I always wondered how people did that, and now the instructions were clear and concise. Well, I ought to get it right after uh, doing it twice. I've been using the snipping tool for many years, and your description was perfect. I, I can't find my little uh, raising my hand. What's it under? Reactions. I looked. Oh, there it is. OK. Um, what about Apple? Did you look at that? I don't have an Apple, so. Uh... <laughs> But Sal tells me that there are several ways to do it by various kinds of keyboard shortcuts. Right. So I looked if, it up, it said shift command five. Um, I don't know about the five, I know three and four, but if you want to find the keyboard shortcuts, the easiest way on a Mac is if you go to the system preferences Yeah. and you find the one for keyboard, oh, okay. I believe that's where it is, there's a tab under there for shortcuts where uh -huh. it defines all the shortcuts for everything on the Mac. <laughs> okay. And there'll be a section of there grouped together for doing screen captures. Okay. Thank you. And as I described earlier to Hank, when it was asked, there's a keyboard combination to capture the entire screen and either send it to the clipboard or put it as a graphic file, like in his video um onto the desktop and then uh there's also a way to do a uh grab a section of it like he did in the video with a different key combination lets you draw on the screen and similarly either send it to the clipboard or put it as a graphic file on the desktop so i i missed the first part of what you were saying because of course i was I'd forgotten I was on a Mac right now. You said go to system preferences. System preferences. There should be a system preference for the keyboard. Yep. And in the keyboard system preference, there'll be a tab for shortcuts. Just a minute. Oh, yeah. There. And in there, you'll see all of the keyboard shortcuts for everything on the Mac. There will be a section in there where they're grouped together for screen captures uh where may have to scroll down a ways <laughs> well i've got about 10 on mine the first one is launch pad and dock and the last one is app shortcuts <laughs> and there's another keyboard let me take a look on mine hang on a moment So on my Mac, it's called screenshots. Okay, got it. Not screen captures. And in that section, it'll give you all of the ones for screen capturing. So which one would I pick? It depends on what you want to do. <laughs> I want to snip something. Um, I understand, but you can see there's a description, at least on mine, for each one. So Shift-Command-3 saves a picture of the entire screen 
to a file and it yeah. puts it on the desktop. And if you add the control key to those three, it makes a copy of the screen to the clipboard instead of putting it on the desktop. And if you do shift command four, it saves a picture of the selected area like in um, Hank's video. So it does the same thing, creates a file, puts it on the desktop, but of a selected area, not the entire screen. How did I know to do shift command four? How did you know that? Yes. Yeah, you, you found it in this area. That's what I'm saying. You have to learn it, well, put it on a little post-it note next to your monitor yeah. <laughs> if you can't remember it. But no, uh, but it's not it's not here. You don't have a shift command for nowhere. Okay. And I know understand that we're probably running different versions of the Mac operating system. Okay. But right. but that is the conventional one. And there is in fact a shift command five, which I wasn't aware of. And that says screenshot oh, I, and recording options. So yeah, you can do video, okay. I guess, apparently also yeah. in your captures. Yeah. Uh, so mine yes. is under services. Really? <laughs> it says it says picture, capture, full screen, capture screen using timer, capture selection from screen, import image, a whole bunch of stuff here. <laughs> but still nothing about shift command anything. Oh, yes, it does. Sorry. There it is. Yep, it does. It's under services on mine. Well, Mac moves things around. I mean, Apple moves things around. Yep. <laughs> so, thank you. You're welcome. Well, any other questions or comments about uh, snipping? Yes, I do. It's Barbara. Um, yeah. When I do the uh, search for snipping tool, I got a message come up saying the snipping tool is moving. In a future update, snipping tool will be moving to a new home. Try improved features and snip like usual with snip and sketch. Or try the shift plus S. Interesting. I, I get that. It, it was on the first little window that you get down at the bottom. Exactly. Right. Message. Oh, okay. I just thought I'd comment in case you didn't realize it. Thank um, you. I I haven't I haven't tried the new system yet, so I decided not to sound like I'm an expert when I know nothing. <laughs> I um, Arlene, I have uh, I have taken a picture of the screen I have in my dining room. And if everybody else doesn't mind for a minute, I'm going to uh, share that right now. There. Interesting that mine has some of the same figures on it that yours does. I bought mine in Guam. Okay. What is that? What is that, Hank? What is it? Yeah. It's an oriental screen that sits in the corner of my dining room. Right. Is it what type of uh, fabric or is it? It's a wooden screen and uh, let me go back to the chair screen for a minute. It's a wooden screen that I mean, a, a, a screen that has um, ivory or mother of pearl or all of these individual things are attached. They're, they're maybe a quarter of an inch thick and made out of uh, various solid material, shiny, as I say, either jade or mother of pearl or something very similar. Is there a theme to it? No, at least not one that I know. There might be if you're, if you are uh, a connoisseur of Chinese, I think sure. Chinese rather than Japanese, but I'm not sure. Our princesses. A long time ago. Beautiful. 
I have a small chest in that style with the stone appliques. My screen is the many, many layers of paint, and then they carve it away to make the pictures. Oh, interesting. Um, Marty has your hand up. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know if the uh, snipping tool was related to Dropbox. If uh, you know you snip no. it and then you put it in a Dropbox, or I don't understand the Dropbox. Neither do I. So <laughs> I'm not going to answer. Um, I, I have used Man, the no. Dropbox. Um, and it's a file sharing program where it links to the cloud and you can have other people linking to the same files in the cloud and share files. Uh, it is not related to a sync, um, screen grab, except that screen grab creates files that can be shared with others. Right. That's the only connection to Dropbox. Instead of putting it on your desktop, you might put it in the Dropbox, but I don't know. If you wish to share it with others, yes. There are many programs and places where you can put things in the, in the cloud. And a lot of them have a certain amount of space free. And then you have to start paying when it fills up. And mine... My Dropbox filled up a long time ago, so oh. I, I have chosen not to use it. Oh. It's made money, and I, I choose to use Google Drive or Google Docs. It used to be, because you get 15 gigabytes of space in Google Drive, free, and I'm only up to about three or four. Wow! And you can also, if you if you run out of space in one place, you can set up a new Gmail address and that and every new Gmail address gets you another Google Drive of 50. Oh. I have one for the seniors computer group and one for me. Uh, Hank, I don't understand that. How, why does it give you extra space? Why? I didn't ask. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I no, but, uh, I set it up. I set it up that way so that I could have a completely separate place for saving things belonging to the seniors computer group, like all the uh, all the videos that I have made that are recordings of of these meetings. I'll make it's being this is being recorded right now and at the end of the day i'll go find that file and put it in google drive oh. seniors computer group and then put a link to that uh each one of these recordings is about a gigabyte it's they're big they're video recordings and videos take up a lot of space and uh, right so i have uh, a, a Gmail account, uh, okay? Yes. Is that what you're, you're talking about a Gmail account, right? Y yes. If and you so, have a Gmail account, you have a Gmail Drive, a Google Drive folder, or a Google Drive place on the internet, place on oh. the cloud. You have it, and the, the way you do it, let me just show someone. Ever, any, no, I guess I can't do that that easily. Well, wait a minute. I'll look, I'll look around after the, the session. But no. I have a question for Stan. Here's another sort of a probably stupid question. Stan, what's the screen grab? Um, I'm glad you asked me a stupid question. I probably couldn't answer an intelligent question. Um, a screen grab is what we're talking about. Uh, it's capturing something that is on the screen. Um, it's a snipping tool. I mean, oh. it's a snip of what you're, what's on the screen. All right. And thank you for asking a stupid question. Okay. <laughs> so basically, it's just another way to, to explain a, a snip. 
Yeah, and there's another way to do yeah. it. There's a key on a Windows keyboard that says print screen, or it says P-R-N-T-S-C-R. -S and if you tap that key, it makes a picture of, it puts a, a screen grab or a snip of your entire display on your clipboard. And you can then save that <laughs> just the way you would save a snip. That's great. So you'd save it and you could actually snip that, could you? Say it again. Say that again. You could save the the print screen and then you could snip it. Uh, snip a portion of it. Well, you don't need to snip it. You can it, it becomes a an image on your clipboard, and you can then paste it into an image program that you have, or you can even paste it into the body of a Word document. Pictures go in, in Word documents easily. Then you so what if you don't need the entire screen? You yeah. just need a portion of it. Okay, if you need a portion of it, then you can go into an image processing program that allows you to crop. Cropping <laughs> will cut down any image to some smaller small smaller portion thereof using Thank the you. snipping tool to begin with is a, is a shorter way to do it you just then can grab the piece that you want versus having to do a print screen and then find the image and open it up and then do a uh, snipping tool on it just use the snipping tool to start with yeah that is very good advice, which is what usually comes out when the yellow box goes around Mr. Malloy's picture. Okay, I think it's uh, Ross. Do you have your hand up for something else? Yes, sir. Uh, so, in you spoke of using uh, Dropbox and other ways to share files through, like Google Drive. Uh, I use a utility, a website called um oh i've forgotten it for the moment there where we can upload a file to it it's called it's called solar s-o-l-a-r send it all together dot com and that lets you upload to them up to one and a half gigabytes worth of a file and then share a link to somebody. So if you have a lot of things that you want to share with somebody, then you can directly do that from Solar Send It. And then again, you upload it, it creates a link. Uh, it tells you, ask you how long you want to save it there. There is no signing up. There is no credit card. We've been using it for about five years. It works very well when it says, oh, wait a minute, I have only, I can only email 10 to 15 million bytes at a time in a file where Solar Send It lives you one and a half gigabytes to send. There's another way to do that. It's to send it by Gmail and go into an put an attachment every every week or at least every or every month for sure i send a copy of my entire quicken file which takes care of all my finances to my daughter who's the executor of my estate and one of these days is going to be doing all the things that i now do financially and when i click on the paper clip which is a standard symbol for attaching something to an email. If you do that in Gmail and the thing you're clicking on or the thing you want to send is bigger than, I think it's 25 megabytes, uh, it says, this is too big. Uh, we are putting it, we are creating a link to it and they put it then in your, uh, your drive, and they send just a link to that item in the drive. And, and I think Is that, that Google Drive? Yeah, I think that the whole thing, Gmail, Google Drive, it's all part of uh, 
Mr. Mr. Google's uh, attempt to dominate the world, he's doing pretty well, I think. And I don't think there's a limit to that link, to the size of that link. I know my Quicken file takes a, about three minutes to load. Okay, are we done with uh, attachments and the, the cloud and putting things various places for other people to look at? If so, I will shift to Q&A. Will is not here, so Sal and I will attempt to answer your questions. Won't we, Sal? <laughs> Where'd he go? <laughs> I'm here, we will, but I will also note that Ross just posted in the chat information of a good subject. Oh. Where is chat? Should be under so there. Last there. week, you mentioned you wanted to do a, a presentation on how to clean your hard drive before you deleted, you sent your computer off to be recycled or to somebody else. Um, and I sent you a link and the document and you posted it to everybody saying, here are the steps that you do for an Apple, for a, a PC, I believe an Android device. It said in there, here's the steps that you go in and basically reload the operating system for that computer. And that overwrites everything on the drive. Um, and that that's pretty good. There are some fair number of steps to go through to get that accomplished. Uh, I find it's easier for most people if I just open the case up on their laptop or desktop computer, take out the hard disk and hand it to them. There, there's no way that that information can be recovered because you still have it. There are ways if you work hard enough that you can get information off of a drive that's been reformatted, reloaded. Uh, you may not get everything, but you can get snippets. So again, if you want to be really careful about giving away your information, find out how to open that computer case up, remove the hard disk from your desktop or from your laptop, then you can recycle it. You just put that hard disk in a drawer and leave it there called archive or whatever else you want to call it. Um, if those steps that you find from Google saying, this is how I remove my laptop, my, excuse me, my hard disk from my Dell laptop, then there's a company that I use called You Break I Fix. There's a, it's a chain and there's a number of stores throughout San Diego. You might contact them and say, this is what I need to do. What would it cost me for you to remove my laptop's hard disk? And then they should be able to take it and say, okay, five minutes, here we go. Pull the drive and, and charge you whatever they need to charge you to do that. I would think they would be reasonable on there. Then again, when you recycle that particular computer, your information is not going with it. There's also the, uh, the uh, erasing mechanism commonly known as a sledgehammer after you get your hand on that. Uh, that, that's true. But if you're the one that's holding it, you know, and, and to what my thought was on there from a long time ago is as time goes by, if it's four or five, six years from the time that that drive was active in the computer, you have new passwords, you have new, you know, so nobody, that information is no longer valid and can be easily used against you. Um, if you have your Intuit backup of your, your data files or tur TurboTax on there, yeah, that gives out your social security and a lot of other information that you have to be careful with. But again, that's why I recommend that you just pull that drive out and label it as such, or as Hank mentioned, break it up. Stanley. Uh, on that same subject, if you're going to, um get rid of a drive and you, you would like to recycle it for the materials in it and uh, erasure by sledgehammer should not affect the uh, recycling ability for the uh, precious metals that are in there. Is that a correct assumption? 
Uh, in general, yes. If you if you've broken up the circuit card that's on the back and you've damaged the case around it, uh, the chances that somebody is going to try to repair that unless they know they need to get information from this particular drive for whatever reason, then yes, that they're going to do it that way. Uh, on the same kind of idea is I heard of a guy that is a uh, steals information from people. Uh, identity theft. And one of the things he does is he goes to the local dumps and, and picks up full sheets of paper and, and finds the information that way. He says, if it's a half sheet of paper or smaller, he doesn't mess with it. He just goes for the big sheets of paper. So if you want to make it harder for somebody to get a hold of, just tear those pieces of paper at least in half and put it in the trash and they're probably going to be relatively safe. In Hawaii, the trash goes to uh, an incinerator. Pretty safe. You just have to make sure that, again, if they're targeting you, then they can get to the information. Oh, yeah, they can get the trash. When you put it out on the street, it's up for grabs. Right. Well, I don't see any hands for Q&A. My goodness. We're just wondering where Will is. <laughs> it's a, it's 11, 15, only 11.15 and we're about done. Anybody? Yeah, Dan. Well, while we're talking about keeping information secure, you also promote backups. So now you have two copies uh, at least, and probably more of that information. So I don't know whether you're trying to keep information secure or you're trying to uh, get rid of it. Well, but the other thing is people using uh, the cloud. And we have all a lot of information out there. And we have people that keep asking you questions and collecting your information like banks and financial places and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult to keep your information secure. That's all I have. I think that backup drives are much less likely to uh, to be something that you would give to a, a charity. You know, computers for kids, they'd be happy to have your laptop or your, or your desktop. And some of us are, are helping organizations like that. And that's the sort of a situation where you don't want to give your drive away with the, with the uh, computer. If I were trying to steal your information, I'd rather have your backup drive than your hard drive because your hard drive's got a lot of other garbage on it. Right. Your backup's pretty selective. Not, not, not really. I, I don't, I don't go along with being selective in the backup. Um, I always set the backups up to backup everything on that computer such that we could take that back up to a different computer and restore everything on there. All the programs, all the serial numbers, all the data files. Um, it's kind of like to say where you're going to, you're going to be the one that does the backups. I, I don't like that. I want the program to be an automatic basis where it does it on a nightly basis is good, but you shouldn't have to do anything to make it back up because we all get busy and then we all stop doing the backups is what I've seen. So set it up to be automatic, leave it connected all the time and let it back up. The backup files, as far as being vulnerable to encryption by the encrypting viruses seem to be avoided by those viruses because they're so big. So when they try to compress it and put a password on it, it takes a really long time if you've got a 30, 40, 100 gigabyte file with all the backup in it. So they ignore those and go on. 
Interesting. Dan, your hand's still up. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have some more to say, but I guess I'm over. Elizabeth. <laughs> we, get, we get to arguing about... We, I'm sorry, Danny, you still you still have something to say or ask or Dan, you're muted. I think he said he didn't have anything else to contribute. Okay, then I'll move on. Elizabeth, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, my question is, um, which backup system do you like best to back up your data? Well, um, again, I want something that's easy. I want something that you don't have to do anything with. The easiest one that I know of and work with for, for many years is called Carbonite. Uh, it's a paid for program. It's about $100 a year. You install it on the computer. It goes through and selects the files on your computer that are going to be backed up. Now, it only the, the basic version of the program only backs up the data files, not your programs and Windows and all the rest. But the basic program copies all that information up to Carbonite automatically. As long as your computer is on and connected to the internet, then no matter where it is, it will do a backup. Um, to begin with, it may take several days to get all that information pushed up. So don't turn your computer off, which is what I recommend anyway. But then the Carbonite program, you can go to Carbonite.com with your email address and password and retrieve any one file or everything back to wherever you are. So again, if that computer was to disappear, you still have a copy of that information somewhere else. Now, am I concerned about someone breaking into Carbonite and getting into the information? Not so much. So far, and it, it always can change tomorrow, but so far, they have been able to keep the bad guys out. And the other only thing that I can think of is that there's so many people using that type of service, even though they might break in like with Dropbox or with um, uh, Google Drive, there's so much information out there for them to get back to you as an individual. It's it's very, very, very low percentage. Um, there are backup programs that I like to use to a hard disk that's plugged into the back of the computer. Ease US Toto backup free works very well. It takes a little configuration and then it will do a backup all the time. Um, with uh, Carbonite, one of the things I like about it is that when you sign up for it, you're giving them an email address because they're going to send you a bill. But also, if your backup doesn't work or has a problem, you will get an email from Carbonite saying things are not working right. And you can go in and investigate that and or if need be, you contact Carbonite and they will help you get your backup working again. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Ross has given a, a, a standard Seniors Computer Group presentation on backing up several times, but uh, he, he sort of does it in a mini format, just like today, rather often when the subject comes up. Joan Edwards, your hand is up. What would you like to ask or say? Well, this is, might be for Ross or anyone else who can answer it. <clears throat> I have a, a backup called Passport by WD. And I use it for my uh, laptop, which is Windows. And it has worked wonderfully, but all of a sudden, it won't, uh, it'll show that it's connected, but it will not open at all. Now, I want to qualify this too. Right now, because of a number of reasons, I'm having a lot of trouble with Wi-Fi, almost to the point that I am thinking of spending $1,500 on Starlink.
Okay, so that's two different subjects to me. The first mm. is your backup drive. Yeah. Um, to me, a backup drive is kind of like a fire extinguisher. Um, if you have any trouble with it, buy a new one. You that's a security device. There's no reason to fuss with it. If it's under warranty, then you can contact Western Digital. But then that means you have to send that drive to them, which again you don't want to do. Uh, a backup drive. A two terabyte drive, I think now is about $50. And for $100, you can get like a five terabyte drive, tremendous amount of space. That drive then can be plugged into the back of a PC or a Mac and do backups to that physical device. Um, in, a Mac, in a Mac, there's a program called Time Machine that works very, very well. Very easy to configure. Basically, you, you install Time Machine on the computer, and when you plug a hard disk in, Time Machine will say, hey, can I use this drive? And you say yes, and then from then on, it manages all the backups for you. And when you get a new computer or have a problem, you just plug that drive into the new computer. And, and again, at the beginning, when you have a new uh, Mac, it comes back and says, do you have a time machine backup? And you say, yep. And it goes and finds it and restores everything back to the computer. Works very easily and very good. I like that. Um, I have that. I have that. So everything on this is gone. I didn't I didn't say that, but you were saying if it's a backup device to be used for backup, then you should need get another device. If there's information on there that you need to recover, then we'd have to investigate that. If you plug it into the computer, it shows you the drive, but then doesn't show you anything on it. Yes. Well, then... You can right click on that particular drive in Windows Explorer and go to tools and you can run a check disk on it. Okay, Windows Explorer. Yes, and can you find that particular drive, drive D, E, F, whatever that one is, you right click on that drive. Right. Right. Okay, that's good. That's my first question. My second question it, uh, re, uh, concerns Zoom. Okay, I do a Zoom myself that I set up on Sunday nights. And all of a sudden, well, this, when you open up a Zoom window, as you know, there's four boxes, join, schedule, I can't remember what the other two are. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So on the laptop, the Windows works fine. On the Mac, the join and the uh, two of the the other two come up, but schedule will not come up. Two weeks in a row. You're muted, Ross. <laughs> On the Mac, sounds to me like your Zoom's uh, program is not logged in to Zoom. And I would verify that on the upper right hand side that you see your name and it's in your account. Uh, that's what it would seem because again, if you don't, if you're not logged in, you're not going to be allowed to schedule an event. Looks like Joan's system is frozen. She mentioned earlier that she was having trouble with Wi-Fi. So maybe it has dropped out. Okay, we'll move on to someone else until her Wi-Fi plugs her back in to us. Oh. If we have other questions, we're in QA. Uh, I, I have a comment about Wi-Fi. Um, I believe it was Willie that was showing that he was using uh, mesh 
uh, Wi-Fi extenders from Amazon. Um, and he was having good success with those. And I would have you verify, but uh, if you were to have a um, Amazon, um, it's a, a their uh, their device that you speak to. Uh, uh, not, it's not Alexa, is it Alexa? Whatever the Amazon device is that you use to talk to Amazon. It's called an Amazon Echo. I'm going to. Um run a program on that within the next few weeks. You're muted again, Ross. <laughs> if I keep talking loud enough. Uh, if I read that the uh, Amazon device has a Wi-Fi extender built into it that is mesh compatible. So if you happen to have an Amazon device, you can set that up and when you connect with the Wi-Fi, I believe it's supposed to extend your net Wi-Fi network. Joan, you were uh, frozen a while, but you hadn't finished, I gather. Your hand is still up. No, I just wanted to apologize to Ross. What happened is I did what I shouldn't have done. I decided, oh, I would try that while we were talking. And of course, it went to the login window and caught me out. And so I just want to apologize. <laughs> So it did log you in on your Apple device to your uh, your Zoom account? I tried to, and then the screen, uh, it came up, but it was still looking the same. But I'll look in that into that a little deeper uh, okay. after the. Okay. Okay. Can, can I just ask John a question? Sure. Is this a recurring meeting you have in your Zoom account? Uh, I don't press recurring. I put personal meeting. So, so it's a separate meeting each time that you set up. Yes. Okay. Just just asking because if it's a regularly, you know, periodic meeting, like once a week or something, you could set it up as a recurring meeting in your Zoom account. And then it would always have the same URL link. Yeah and might be easier for you to access than the other people. I think I tried that once and ran into a problem or something. So I went back to just doing it that way. So um, I'd like to make a comment on that. You, you can set up a recurring meeting and so check me if I'm wrong. I don't think you have to specify dates. You can simply define it as a recurring meeting and it will keep the same um, meeting ID, but uh, it will only occur whenever you start it. But that's, that's the advantage of a recurring meeting is it locks in the meeting ID. It does not have to be at a specific time or day. If that's the reason. Just yeah. Generally recurring meetings are set up like, you know, every Saturday or once a month on the third Tuesday or whatever the criteria is. And that's fairly easy when you set one up, it gives you all the options and you can set it up however you wish it. Maybe next week I will, uh, I'll, on the laptop, I will uh, do that. This, I will try that. Meeting, I'll turn this, it to a recurring. This meeting is set up as a recurring meeting and I can start at any time I want. Yes, that's true. Anyway, I was going to finish off by saying to Joan, regardless of whether it's a recurring meeting or you do it manually each time, um, instead of going to the Zoom app on your Mac, <laughs> just go to the Zoom account and start the meeting from there. Through your browser, you would go to zoom.com and sign in. Yeah, zoom.us, but yes. Okay, um, more subjects for Q&A, more questions, concerns, things that didn't go well. My goodness, I can't believe that nobody had a thing that didn't go well this week. Is there a planned topic for next week? Yes, uh, oh, hey, I have a Q&A. Let me, 
And, and that's what reminded me. There is a planned topic, and I'm now going to show you what it is and where I keep it and show you a problem that is brand new. Wait a minute. I need to go and get to my calendar. Another, another place. There. Now, let me come back here, and I will share my screen. Share my calendar. Here we go. Now, see, this is August 2022. You will see there are two kinds of meetings on here, blue meetings and gray meetings. That's because I have two calendars. You can see this over here. One calendar is Hank Drayton's calendar, which is the stuff that I have to do or the places where I'm going to take my wife for her interest in education, medical appointments, et cetera, et cetera. There's stuff on here that I probably don't want to share with you. <laughs> personal. And there is also uh, items all on Saturdays that are senior computer group meetings because I have two calendars and I'm showing them both at the same time, both at the same time for August. If I scroll to the right or down, I get September's and I get the same thing. See that all? And these were the subjects of our, of our meetings, the gray ones. Here was a board meeting. There was Willie on Excel uh, in September, et cetera. Now, if I go one more month, whoops, just one more month to October, look. No gray meetings, unless I click right here, two more. Then there is a gray meeting, so it's still there. There was a board meeting, and the following week, there was using the snipping tool, and the following week, there is going to be, next week, introducing Amazon Echo. But... I can't see that in October. I can't see any of those meetings, any of the gray ones. And it's very interesting that if I go back to May, see, here's one. April, yes, they're there. May, yes, they're there. June, yes, they're there. July, not there. Unless I click on the individual one, because they really are there. But in July, they don't show. In August, they show. In September, they show. And in October, they stop. Every three months, they disappear. Does anyone have a suggestion as to how I can fix that? Hank, does it have anything to do with the Zoom level that you're at on that web page? The Zoom level? Like if you Zoom in more, does it change? Uh, how do I zoom? You mean control? Control plus. Let's see. Okay, I have control plus twice. No. Aha! Yes, it does. Good on you, Saul. Thank you very much. Let's see if... Yeah, November, I don't have anything set up yet. But October now shows, September shows, and August shows, and July shows. And okay, isn't that interesting? You zoom in too much and certain things disappear. It can't handle that amount of data at a certain zoom level. Okay, I'll stop sharing and go back to Elizabeth, who has a question. Yes, I have a very major problem. Uh, I have a Windows 10 laptop that's hooked up to a Canon uh, printer. And I used to be able to use a so-called PDF app to be able to scan uh, on my printer. And it worked for years. And then all of a sudden it stopped working. So my computer guy, uh, 
change things. He said, well, it's because Windows 10 does automatic updates and that's what's screwing things up. So he did all of that. And the end result is now the program acts like it's working fine, but when all is said and done, the result is a blank page. And so I asked my computer guy, do you think it's an issue with the twain drivers or something like that? And he said, uh, I don't think so. So bottom line is I cannot use the scanning function anymore uh, from my laptop. And I'm wondering if anybody has an easy solution besides using my cell phone to uh, scan documents because I can't document, I can't do it. I think I may. I, I've had the same problem. I was using Windows Fax and Scan to do all my scans when I needed something scanned. And I had problems. I I don't know how I came into this, but I found a program for my particular printer. I have an HP printer and I went to HP and did some searching about HP printer scanning. And I came up with a, uh, let me just go look. Can't remember what it's called. Um, it's called HP Smart, S-M-A-R-T. And I've installed that and I now use that to scan and I have no more problems. I, you said your printer was a what? A, can, a Canon. Canon. Canon I, image I, class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would so, go to, I'd go to Canon customer support, call them on the phone or find them under you know, canoncustomersupport.com and, and ask if they have a program and try that. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Some, sometimes what you need to do is uninstall completely the, the software that's there from Canon and then get your new software and install it again. Uh, I'm also seeing that like Brother Printers, really don't want to talk to a printer that's connected by wire. They want to talk to it by wireless. Now you can use the wire to start with and that way it can communicate to the printer like getting set up to your Wi-Fi. But it's again, they're trying to, it seems the direction most of the companies are wanting to go right now is to connect your printer by wireless. But if you get a blank page, I, I, that's telling me that the computer is talking to the printer and, and executing a scam. Um, I would make sure that I have the, the image facing the glass that you're trying to scan, not that you might be scanning the back of the paper. Oh, I know I was doing the right thing in terms of, you know, putting the text uh, all right, all right. At, the, at the bottom. Okay. You, right. you know, um, I presume this is a multifunction device that it also can do copies. Yes. So yes. obviously, if you put something on the glass and you make a copy and it comes out, then it's not like the scanner part is not working anymore in the in the machine itself. OK, so what are you saying then? Well, just in case there was something broken in the scanning portion of the multifunction device, but if it can make a copy, we know that's not a problem. It's just to eliminate that as a possible issue. Yeah, I know I, mean, I can make copies. I know I can make copies. So then it's just a matter of communicating with the computer at some point. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think Hank's suggestion and Ross's are good. Just go to Canon, get their software. It's their device. They probably know best how to talk to it. OK, thank you. I, I am actually planning a, a presentation here comparing Windows Fax and Scan to my, my printer's uh, specialized scanning device or scanning program. Okay, more questions, more 
concern. A quick observation, as I have found that as HP Smart a very valuable tool for scanning quickly and um, scanning to PDF and one thing or another. How many people here wave your hand if you do it well? A lot of people don't have pictures. How many ha here have uh, have Hewlett Packard printers? Yeah, they're pretty common. Wow. Yep. That that persuades me to go ahead with that presentation, which I have not made yet. But <laughs> I I have the uh, Instant Ink feature. And it, uh, even though it doesn't cost me very much, I find it very intimidating to make unnecessary copies, even though I really find it quite cheap. Quite often I get by for 99 cents a month and occasionally it pops up to $1.99, uh, but rarely higher than that. But I am cautious about making unnecessary copies, but I find that uh, very valuable. and simplifies my um, thinking about ink and one thing or another. I, I agree with that. And there's a gentleman I work with that is a photographer and he cuts, prints out color pictures. So that means the whole page is covered with ink. And that's a lot because what they're figuring on when they're counting the number of pages, that you're covering between five and 10% of the page with ink. So if you're doing a lot of images, printing full pages, yes, that HP Insta Ink is a very good program in there. Um, you can carry over from month to month so if you sign up for 30 pages a month and you only use 10 then you can carry those 20 pages over till the next month after three months those pages drop off i believe is what their program is um i will hesitate to remind you that when you put in those ink cartridges from hewlett packard those are in control by hewlett packard if you go in and say i no longer want to be a member of your service Insta Ink, they turn those ink cartridges off. <laughs> and you have to buy a full set of ink cartridges at the store to get that printer to work again. So that's I did not know that. <laughs> when you first that's start, also you you know you have ink cartridges that are in there, but you are not using that service until you replace all of your ink cartridges with the Insta Ink ones. But again, it's it's a good program. You just have to monitor and saying I'm paying X number of dollars per month. Is that a reasonable deal for me? Yes. I find that fascinating. That 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 Mr. Hewlett and Mr. Packard can reach into my computer and my printer and turn off some cartridges that I have bought. So the cost of toner and the cost of ink is higher than the cost of gold. <laughs> That's why they do it that way. They give you the printers for nothing and then they charge you a lot of money for the ink. To me, that's one of the very first considerations when I'm looking at a printer that's saying, okay, this is going to print fast enough. This is going to print big enough for me. Then how much is it going to keep me to cost me to keep this printer working? Dan, your hand is up. Yes, I have a visitor here. His name is Dave, and he would like to ask a question. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Um, you guys are talking about printers. Well, my son worked for Hewlett Packard, and after about a year of working there, he said he would never use an inkjet printer again. He uses all laser now. It, number one, it's cheaper. It doesn't, uh, when it gets wet, it doesn't uh, bother the ink. Right. Um, you know, he said, I can't, under the only reason maybe, maybe that he'd use uh, inkjet is if he had to have color. Now, I thought I had to have color. Well, guess what? I really don't need color. Well, you, you I don't know how many of you need, need color. Think about it. But uh, if you get, if you want to switch to a, a laser printer, you'll find out how cheap it is. One cartridge will last you probably a lifetime. I mean, I'm serious, unless you really print out a lot of stuff. 
So that's my two cents worth. Uh, yes, a black and white laser printer that you can buy between $100 and $150, depending on what our supply chain is available. I use print, it will cost, it will, the toner cartridge will last you several thousand pages. I think my wife's will last up to say 3,000 pages for a toner cartridge that I pay about $15, $20 for. Now, again, it's black and white. If you want to go to color, yes, you can buy an ink, excuse me, a, a laser printer that uh, you have, again, toner cartridges, not liquid ink, and it's dramatically less expensive. Um, but the printer itself will be in the range of four to $500. It's not $100 for that printer. Right. They make their money one way or the other. Yes. Well, I tell you what, once you start using laser, you'll never go back to anything because that, like he said, these cartridges last forever. Right. And um, the last one I bought, well, if you buy in, you can buy these lookalikes, you know, the, the what do you want to call it, generic, um, like he said, for 20, 30 bucks, if that. If yep. you want to get, you know, I got a brother printer. If I wanted to get a brother, it costs about $60, $70. So. Yep. Yep. You know, and I bought all these uh, <laughs> uh, generic ones. Um, and they work just as fine. It's, it's crazy to spend the money on a printer, on the ink, I mean. Okay, we're done with that subject. I'll shift to Barbara Wilkinson. Okay, I'm still on that same subject. <laughs> I have a HP printer. And I don't make a lot of copies, but I do use just a generic print, a uh, generic print. Um, cartridges, ink cartridges. There we go, <laughs> cartridges. And they work fine, but periodically I get a message come up. Uh, yep. You know, you're not using HP cartridges. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but as I said, it's been no problem and works just fine for my use. But they then, threaten you that your printer will die any moment. I know. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Um, they they have some of the companies have, including in lasers, they put chips in there so they can go out there and interrogate that cartridge to see how many pages have been used is one of them. And the other one is is actually is it a valid, authentic cartridge for this manu from this manufacturer. Uh, some companies in the past, I don't know of anybody recent, but in the past have locked it such that if you put in a generic in there, it will not work. Um, they tried to change their terms and policies when you accept to use the printer that you you will uh, testify that you will only use the cartridges from that company. Now, if you have to pay $70 to get one from Hewlett Packard and you buy two from Amazon for that same printer for say $10, that company HP has lost a lot of money and they don't they're not in business to lose money. But yes, you have to be careful with that, with the supplies. Uh, I went to an HP presentation as a dealer many, many years ago. And at that point, they still told us that 70% of their income was from supplies. You worked for HP? No, no, I was a dealer. So when I was selling HP laser printers, then I was invited to come to an HP dealer meeting. And in okay. that meeting, is that what that's what they told us, that all the film and ink and toner, and, and you can look that up for many, 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 many articles as far as what is the actual cost of ink in an ink cartridge. And it's nothing compared to what they charge for it. Every company in the world has to make a living. And I agree. Public companies have to keep their shareholders happy. So, uh, as you know, it's your your idea is to keep as much money of yours in your bank account, not in somebody else's. Joan Edwards. Yes, uh, Stan and Saul already know about this, but I wanted to pass this on and maybe get an answer. A friend of mine in San Diego just bought a new Hewlett Packard computer mm -hmm. with Windows 11. Yep. And for some reason, he ended up with S mode. And in oh. S mode, only, That's uh, bad. only uh, 
What am I you can on? only Lightning. install. You can only install programs from the, I excuse me the uh, uh, Microsoft store. Yeah. But you pay. You got a discount on the computer because it had S mode. If it is returnable, I would return it. He just took it off. So he upgraded to uh, another version of Windows, which which you can do too, and pay the time and money yeah. to do that. But yeah, well, he, it, he went. To, he got rid of the S mode. He just still had Windows 11, but he did not have S mode anymore. You can take it off, but you can't put it back on. So Apple does this also by saying that they really, 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 really don't want you to get any programs. Uh, but except from the Apple Store, and and that's this is attempt from uh, from Microsoft to do the same thing, to yeah. force you to get your apps from them. I'll ask him the next time and ask him if it was a discount or what discount he got. Well, my 